Okay. There. Can everyone? Did everyone get a notification? If not, yep. it, it said recording in progress to me. So. Yeah, it, it asked me to say okay. Me too. So, so Peter, I need to ask you a question. Um, can you can you hold off showing this? Uh, later on, I, I don't even have to. I was just offering it up. So no, no, no. I, I I think it's it'd be a good to, a good to see because we don't really <laughs> have a full agenda. But uh, also love your background. But um, uh, the uh, but I don't know if you're under a time constraint. That's that's really I why am. I, I need to leave it at the bottom of the hour. But you know, don't worry about it. I mean, I, we can do it another time. Uh, okay. So let me let me go back to sharing my screen here. And welcome everyone. And thanks for showing up. Sorry about the uh, the last minute uh, uh, rearranging of the schedule, um, and appreciate everyone's uh, um, uh, being able to roll with the punches essentially. Uh, and as as Darren said right before we started the recording, um, as far as doing virtual uh, and in person, we're we're still working on it. We're still trying to iron out the logistics. Um, obviously, we've only we've only. Uh, um, this is, I guess, our what our third meeting now since we restarted, uh, and and now our third location uh, technically. Um, we will hopefully be back at Ridgeline next month in June. The uh, the it was just, there was just a sudden issue with with, with the host to the, uh, this weekend um, that that uh, caused us to reorganize. But other than that, uh, they they are still committed and they're still they're still going to help us in the long term. So the plan is to be back at Ridgeline next month uh, and continuing after that. So um, let me, so the moment I went into sharing my screen, all my other windows changed. I really don't like this. All right. So uh, let me start by going through this. So that QR code there will actually take you to the meeting notes, which I'm now showing you here. Um, and so those, those meeting notes, this, this is really, so if anyone remembers our first meeting where we did the Etherpad, uh, and we had people jotting things down. This is this, this is basically that again. So this is open to anyone. You can write in there. Um, we only ask that you be curious and be kind to others. Uh, unlike Etherpad, this is Markdown, um, but it is uh, is is kind of different. Um, this is Hedgehog. This is this is uh, uh, my own instance, which I dedicated for Novalog. So it's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, so feel feel free as you see notes, as you see things that uh, uh, you want to put in or or uh, URLs or links or anything like that that you want to to uh, make others aware of, just go ahead and drop them in there in the appropriate place, and uh, and we can go from there. So, um, and let me go to the slides here. So, as uh, th these are the meeting or uh, the Novalug details, we have a mailing list. I encourage people to join the mailing list. It's not required. Um, you know, we don't. We're an informal group. We don't have membership or anything like that. But the mailing list is a. It's a. It's a great place to ask questions, uh, and also it's where we send a lot of our notices to as well. We also have a website, the Novalug.org website, uh, newly revamped, um, and this is it right here. And uh, uh, you can see we have a lot of the information that uh, about meetings and pre past presentations that uh, we we've had and so forth. So. Uh, that's all on our website. And uh, we have a meetup page, uh, which I'm not going to show you, but the meetup page is generally where we also do meeting announcements. So uh, the three places, if you're looking for a meeting announcement information, is, the, is meetup, uh, Mastodon, and uh, and the mailing list. Uh, they'll, they'll all, I generally tend to uh, send the information to all three at once. Uh, and that brings me back to the Mastodon thing. So we, we do have a, a Novalog specific uh, Mastodon, Mastodon Fediverse account, um, and it is on fostodon.org, which is a Mastodon instance dedicated to free and open source software and the discussions of that. So it's a pretty cool instance, in my opinion. Um, so that's uh, that's another place where you'll see a lot of uh, our information. Um, just for meeting logistics, as we've already stated, this is being recorded, uh, and we will put the recording up on uh, Nova, sorry, Nova Luck YouTube later on. Uh, I've already shown you the meeting notes, and uh, so feel free to to put anything in the meeting notes you want. Uh, and many thanks to Darren, who uh, scrambling at the last minute offered his Zoom his Zoom uh, account to help host all this. That uh, I very much appreciate that, Darren. Uh, 
basically pulling out all the stops at the last minute to help us. And and many of you know Darren from uh, our previous meetings. He's been doing a lot of the the emceeing at the previous meetings as well. Our as I said, our next meeting will be back at Ridgeline uh, next month in June. So uh, be prepared uh, or be on the lookout for those meeting notices. Actually, I think it's already up on Meetup for the June one. Uh, anyway, and the next meeting will be. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, let me. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So this is kind of the section where one of the things we want to do regularly in our meetings is uh, is ask people if they have any job openings. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but some people have job openings and uh, that are Linux or uh, IT related. And it's a great place for us to do networking. This whole meeting is a great place for us to do networking. So if you have any job openings that you would wish to kind of like give a, a, you know, a one minute blurb about, you know, uh, uh, ad hoc kind of uh, um, um, uh, talk about or, or just mention it, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and uh, we'll let you we'll let you chime in. So, Peter. Yeah, so I don't have the details why that me, but last night, maybe the night before last, we had three or four positions coming out at Red Hat. Basically, it's all about AI. So it's about doing AI with containers and basically uh, the whole Kubernetes infrastructure uh, in a pre-sales uh, situation. So if that has your interest, uh, I can I can forward the link to the, all the details, the glory details. It's definitely not for a beginner uh, having some AI background just a little bit would probably help, um, but be prepared that if you don't know containerization in, at all, that you're going to have a uphill battle. All right. Uh, and Peter, if you could, could you drop that in the meeting notes, the, a link to that under the job section? That'd be, um, that'd be awesome. I you didn't know, do open it. up the meeting notes, but uh, yeah, I will, I will, I'll find the link and send it to you. All right. Okay. Yeah, that'll, that'll work. Anybody else uh, have any job openings that they know about they want to share? Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you all. Um, so next month, when, you know, this is what we planned on this month, but next month we will have the, the tech job hunting seminar that John Kennedy will, will host. And he's going to have a panel some of some recruiters there for people to ask questions and the intent of that, that, whole panel presentation is for people who are looking for jobs. Actually, I, I think everyone should should uh, should basically uh, listen to it or attend because um, unless you're retired, uh, looking for a job is something you're probably going to be doing even if you have a current job. Uh, it just happens, you know, you, you never can predict the future. But the uh, John Kennedy is going to going to uh, do the job, the tech job hunting seminar for us, and John Kennedy is one of the old hands here at Nova Lug. He he helped run it for many years, so. Um. All right, let's go into kind of like the tech news. So. The uh, so kind of in the the not so fun camp of of tech news today, uh, it turns out Google has decided they're no longer going to support Risk Five on Android, and uh, kind of sucks. The the reason I don't know why they're doing that. They didn't really give a reason. It may be that they just don't feel like they need to support it anymore. So it doesn't mean OEMs can't uh, have Risk Five on their uh, for Android uh, Android on Risk Five, but now the OEMs will have to do all the the porting work themselves, uh, whereas before Google was doing it and basically helping out their vendors. So kind of bad news for that. Um, the uh, it turns out now that uh, you know Arch they only really officially supported x86 and now they have decided to dedicate infrastructure and testing for ARM and Risk Five so that's kind of good news going in the other direction of Google so uh, from now on uh, Arch is going to be is going to be targeting what they call the Arch Linux ports which is which is uh, um, an Arch infrastructure for doing testing on multiple multiple different uh, multiple different architectures. Speaking, keeping on this, uh, you know, alternative uh, architecture type of uh, theme here, it, Linus Torvalds now has his own ARM uh, Ampere system. So it was kind of big news last year when he was given uh, Apple Silicon and Apple uh, laptop with, a, I believe it was an M2 chip. And he was doing a lot. Of, he was helping out the Asahi Linux people and doing a lot of a lot of his tests on there. 
but even he admitted that it wasn't something that he was doing on a on a he was like maybe doing tests on a on a weekly basis but now he has a a desktop class arm system uh given to him by ampere and so he's been doing a lot of builds on there and he said he says he's doing almost as many builds on that as he is doing on x86 so linux on arm is is progressing quite well Continuing our little theme of alternate uh, 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 or non-x86 hardware, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the laptops. The the laptops that Qualcomm has been showing off. They've been they've been doing a lot of uh, uh, going around to the doing a you know full press court on their new their new um, laptops. Those laptops aren't actually for sale. Those are uh, what they call. Um, uh, uh, I guess uh, demonstration versions or something like that. Uh, it, it basically hardware references that they 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 they're going to make. But the big deal about that is that it uses the Snapdragon X Elite processor, and so the Snapdragon X Elite processor is an ARM-based processor. It's uh, they're making it both, uh, I believe, desktop class and server class versions of those things. And uh, the the desktop one they're they're putting into all these laptops. Well, they have decided that uh, they're going to support Linux. And so they're doing a lot of work to support Linux uh, on the uh, on the on the Snapdragon X Elite. So I don't know how many people have ARM, ARM desktops, but uh, that will probably be a, a more common thing. If anyone has has ever dealt with the uh, Apple Silicon stuff or has a has an Apple, uh, especially their laptops, you know that the, the ARM processors in there are very power efficient. And um, the laptops generally, I don't think mine, I have one from work doesn't have a fan in it or if it does it's never ever gone on and it is pretty much a it, it's a it's very very impressive so the uh the benefit here is is that that will be coming to to the regular to the to the non apple um hardware set pretty soon so and Continuing our theme, uh, I did not know this, but I found this look, looking around. This is actually a bit of old news. It happened a couple of months ago. But there is a cloud provider in France called Scaleway, and they have decided to launch some RISC-V bare metal cloud servers. And I, I just think that's kind of cool uh, that the RISC-V, uh, the things of the RISC-V uh, ecosystem are continuing to, to evolve and become better. RISC-V is not yet. Uh, at the place where you have, you know, where, where ARM is, or even x86, but it's getting there uh, slowly, and and um, eventually, uh, hopefully, RISC five will will uh, become a dominant architecture. If anyone doesn't know about RISC five, uh, at some point, maybe we can get someone to do a presentation on it. But RISC five is an open instruction set architecture. So unlike ARM and unlike x86, those are licensed. So those are closed. Uh, you. Uh, uh, well, licensing x86 is very difficult. Licensing ARM uh, is not as difficult, but it does require someone to, you know, have a lot of money to do that. Uh, uh, well, generally creating processors is, takes a lot of money, but RISC-V is completely open source. The instruction set is open source. And even beyond that, there are uh, designs for doing RISC-V and S FPGAs, which are which are completely open source. And there are even, there are even um, uh, the circuits, the circuit... Uh, uh, um, I forget what you call those things, the masks that you have that some people have done, which are, which are open source. So it's a pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting ecosystem. Uh, it's younger than both ARM and, and x86, and it's, it's coming along fine. So anyway, the upshot here is that Scaleway has these cloud servers. They're not the most beefy thing on the planet. And, and I suspect what they did was they took, uh, they took something, uh, they took some SBCs and just put them in, uh, in, a, in some racks. Uh, because these SBC, the, their cloud servers aren't really as more powerful than you get on an SBC. They're four core, uh, 1.85 gigahertz systems, um, but uh, uh, it's still kind of cool. If you're doing, if uh, right now RISC-V is very dominant in the, in the, uh, uh, not dominant, but it, it may, it's making a lot of headway in the uh, embedded systems space because the the that's where that's where the pennies really count. And so RISC V is really making making a good headway there. And so the benefit of having a scalable or uh, a cloud server is that if you're doing CI/CD type stuff, type development, even if you're targeting embedded, you still want to you still want some uh, continuous integration. And so that's a way of doing it is is with this cloud infrastructure. So 
All right. Um, so I don't know how many people heard this. So NeoFetch is no longer uh, no longer going to be developed. Actually, I think uh, the guy who started doing it kind of quit uh, quit several years ago. But the uh, the GitHub repository has now been officially archived. So uh, NeoFetch is no more. And um, so for anyone who is doing all that, uh, you know, doing all the flexing uh, with, with your Linux systems, you're going to have to find another another uh, um, one of these things that shows all the all the information about your system. There are actually many others. And so I, I think a lot of people have probably already switched away from NeoFetch, but uh, NeoFetch is now now archived. Um, and uh, I thought this was pretty funny. I'll, I'll try Nano once I quit VM. The uh, you know going along with the whole the whole cute uh, uh, people don't know how to quit out of VM type thing. Nano eight was released, and it includes a thing called modern bindings. And the mod what the modern bindings do is it it uh, does some some uh, key bindings for very common uh, Nano uh, functions. One of them being how to quit. So uh, now you can quit faster out of Nano. So I thought that was pretty funny. Um, that's it. Any any questions? Anyone have any comments on any of that? Nope, only once. Uh, All right. Not well, not directly about that, but one thing that uh, I've noticed that's probably going to, you know, hit most people uh, as part of this group. And I can't remember if we covered it in the last two meetings. Was uh, Broadcom's acquisition of VMware and the uh, general direction they look to be taking, uh, you know, their marketing and their decisions is probably towards uh, larger companies and larger installations. This is going to start. Uh, causing a little pain with the smaller installations, smaller companies, especially around things like uh, renewals. So I, I would like to, you know, not take up time here, but in the future here, if anybody is running into issues with, uh, um, you know, uh, fighting with uh, the, the the new owner, so to speak. But uh, so thanks for letting me say that. Oh, no problem. So I heard that they are making some version of VMware free now. I don't know which what 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 that is. But I've seen a lot um, of people switching over to Proxmox because of the the, the free VMware player is gone, and instead you can now get uh, Fusion and uh, VMware Workstation Pro for free if you use it uh, for personal use. Oh, so yeah, there's like a small light in the darkness they bring over VMware. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Any other any other news that people think we should uh, they want to bring to our attention? All right. Um, as far as uh, area events, we still only uh, have this one. Uh, if any know of any other area events, but the Southeast Linux Fest is happening in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. That that's happening in June, uh, between the 9th and the 11th. Uh, anyone planning on going? I would go, but I actually have something else going on that weekend. All right. No, no one's going. All right. Well, if you do go, if you do end up going, take pictures, uh, distribute them and uh, or send them to me and I'll distribute them. Uh, I would I would like to go. Uh, it does sound like it'd be a lot of fun, but. OK, so this is kind of the bring your own topic area. Uh, um, John, do you want to go ahead? If you have time, do you want to go ahead and share the thing you wanted to share? Uh, John, uh, uh, Peter. Peter, Peter dropped earlier. Oh, did he? Oh, I did not see. Okay. Well, so this is this is really the informal part of the meeting. So any topic, uh, people just uh, raise your hand or or let's go. I have a small one. Um, okay. I've uh, in my home server. I have uh, reinstalled it. I was running a very basic Ubuntu setup in my home server but I have actually swapped over to Nix OS. So I am learning declarative configuration um, and I'm actually liking it. I like that, you know, my configuration will warn me via compiler if I have typos or something. So, and also version rollbacks too. If I make a typo and break everything, it'll boot up and it'll have like the last running version of my configuration. So I've, I've really been enjoying that. But that's it for me. Just just learning Nix. So so believe it or not, I am on a Nix workstation right now. I'm running Nix OS on this on this workstation. Hell yeah! And um, I I I've confessed to being a newbie 
when it comes to the Knicks. The I I need to try to so my setup before was either Ubuntu or Debian, and then, and then I had all these scripts to like every time. I'm one of these people that like destroys my systems all the time. I yeah. I yeah. I'm constantly reformatting hard drives for whatever reason. Uh, and I have like Raspberry Pis, and so I had, I had all these. The I have this need for like moving stuff around, and never like any like if I have a system die, I'm like, oh well, it just died, and lose anything because everything's all my my workflow practices are to make sure everything's backed up anyway. And so I I recently did Nix OS because I realized all of my scripts for for maintaining Debian and Ubuntu were just getting out of hand. And so yeah, I've tried my I'm trying my hand at Nix OS. The only thing I don't quite get is the difference between so the documentation i think could be a little bit better the the thing i don't get is the difference between um when they when you use home manager and you're trying to uh the, there's home manager within nix os and there's home manager when with just a nix environment uh and some of the documentation I, I think is a little bit uh, a little hard to get because it tells you that uh, you want the home manager to manage itself, but that doesn't make any sense if you're actually on Nick OS, at least not in my opinion. So, but yeah, Nick's OS is, it's kind of cool. Yeah. It, the documentation is not as in depth as like ArchWiki, um, which is kind of a shame uh, but it's still good documentation. What I what I've been using to try and learn it is that you know my favorite editor is Doom Emacs, and the creator of Doom Emacs he he actually maintains his dot files in Nix, and that dot file repo is like a huge inspiration because he uses his a single GitHub dot file repo based on Nix and Nix Flakes to manage not only his like gaming laptop with dual boot but his a uh, Linode, like VPS spin up and spin down and everything. Like he has all of his configuration for all of his PCs in one easily viewable space. And that's compared to the jungle. That is my configuration management of all these separate PCs. Oh, I want, I want that cleanliness, you know, of my code eventually. But, yeah, that's know. That's the, that's like the, the Holy grail there, right? You're just, you're just, uh, yeah, that, that's what attracted me to it too. I just, my, my scripts were just getting out of hand and I wanted something that was a little bit better. Now I still haven't like bought in fully to home manager and I need to the, uh, so is, that uh a, is home manager a GUI or can you run it like, like command line or something? It's, it's a configuration file. So you configure home manager is built is, is, uh, it's kind of a separate piece, part of the Nix like ecosystem, but it's separate from Nix OS itself. Uh, so you use it to manage your your basically your user directory, including any software you have. So you can you can say, you know, as a user, I install I install this package or this package or whatever. Uh, and to my knowledge, it can be really anything that that's uh, even system level. The because Nix Nix tries to keep everything separated. That's one of the, one of the other benefits about Nix is you don't end up with a lot of uh you end up using a lot more disk space, but it keeps a lot of things uh, very separated. So uh, and then Hit Home Manager is this whole system for keeping the your personal like user level stuff separate uh separate and and uh, maintainable, including all your dot files. So you can put you can put dot file stuff in there as well. And uh, now I haven't gone down that route. I'm still still learning, and uh, but it's it's very the whole idea is everything should be reproducible. And you see people online, they're they're like they'll demonstrate their systems. They 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 have these really nice setups with with uh, uh with Wayland and all these tiling window managers and stuff. And they're like, oh, if you want to do this, here's my repo with my my Nix setup, and boom, like it doesn't take any time whatsoever to to reproduce their systems. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh. Yeah, I mean, years of like fighting X11, you know, getting stuff just working and having like uh, an OS that's like really built about around that reproducibility. It like it, it takes a lot of those like gremlins out of your out of your configuration. Yeah, there was a a uh, a Nix. During the during COVID, I believe there was a Nix presentation from at Novalug, which is it's back in the in the um, it's on YouTube, and I did watch it. So that that's kind of worth uh, uh, that's kind of worth watching. I think it was given by someone from the 
uh, that Linux users group over in, in the UK that was doing a lot of presentations and, and with, with us at the time. But it's actually fairly interesting. I One of the things I don't understand about Nix is the flakes yet. I don't quite grok that, but... Yeah, I don't I, really understand them either, but I, I know the people that use like that dot .file repo stuff, they use flakes to enable it. So I, I'm going to have to learn it eventually. Yeah, me too. Me too. So anything else people want to talk about? Any side projects? All right. So uh, what I will do is um, I'm going to bring up this. Uh, I showed this at the very at the meeting back in April. Oh, I get this on the camera. Oh, it's not. Oh, okay, there we go. So, uh, so this is the. I don't know if anyone remembers. This is the the digital clock that I made. Uh, and I showed it briefly at the at the first meeting in or our first meeting, our meeting in April, and then I got a lot of feedback about why it should be GPS and not network based. But anyway, the uh, um, I wanted to go in and, and kind of uh, uh, I, I had this on my desk just in just in case uh, uh, I had time to talk about it. But I did get some questions after that meeting. People came up to me afterwards and didn't really have time to talk to them because you know they they shuffled us out of the out of the library. But uh, the the, there were some questions, people were asking me questions about it. And so I just wanted to, to talk about it briefly. I wish it was on camera a little bit better. The, uh, uh, there we go. And so the, the, what this is, is a, uh, uh, maybe I need to turn on, well, what this is, is it's a, a, a uh, Raspberry, Raspberry Pico, which is, if I can get this thing to focus and quit, doing, quit screwing around. See, it's got plexi or, or, uh, uh, plexiglass on it. So there's a, a Pico right here. And what that is, is that's the kind of like the heart, the heart, the heart of it. And then there's the se seven segment uh, LCDs or LEDs up here. And uh, there's a, uh, that, that comes from Adafruit. And uh, I wired it all together. There's a, on the back, there's a, a buzzer. Um, the in order to get the buzzer loud enough so the the way this works is you plug this into usb and usb has uh is five volts you can get the, the max power you can get is five volts really this thing is really kind of uh there we go maybe maybe Even, I put it in uh, front of my face there we un go uh, unblur your background it should work better yeah but then you get to see all the clutter in my my room <laughs> anyway <laughs> I don't have a nice, uh, nice wall of records like you do, Darren. So um, the uh, but the way way it works is uh, so this is just a perf board. Um, I learned uh, I learned how to do all this uh, kind of hobbyist level electronics on my own. Uh, this is actually the second version. The first version uh, is it's electrically the same as this one, but I just rerouted some of the some of the wires on the board itself just to make it easier for me to figure out. Um, that, uh, so the, and when you do like hobbyist level electronics, especially if it's, uh, like digital electronics, there's really two ends of it. There's the, uh, end of it where you're actually doing the electronics itself. And be then because electronics are brittle, you have to have enclosures. And so like enclosures is whole, a whole art unto itself. And, uh, so I used, um, I used, uh, not Lexan, but, uh, um, uh, these acrylic sheets and I had to actually learn kind of trial and error how to cut acrylic sheets. I've uh, I kind of got it down to uh, don't you have to use a like a, a miter saw or some sort of uh, power saw in order to do it with any type of uh, any type of um, uh, ability to hit a straight edge. Uh, there's some sanding that gets involved. This one I don't know if you can see it on the camera. I I glued these little like feet on there with some super glue and the there's a little bit of uh, stuff I should have cleaned up. So the the when you do like electron hobbyist type electronics, the enclosures themselves are are like a whole art into unto themselves. Let me see if I can power this thing up. Um, so the uh, the the Pico is a it itself is a three volt device and um, a three point three volt device, but there is a there is you get five volts from uh, from USB. I'm having a bit of a time. So, but there is a uh, there is five volts you can get off of the Pico one of the one of the rails on the, on the Pico which comes directly off of the thing. So, here, let me see if I can 
There we go. So it's going through its its startup sequence now, and uh, basically it's telling me uh, it's trying to now attach to the network, the Wi-Fi network, uh, and in a minute, uh, what's it saying? Forty four. So that's telling me it's it's uh, la the last octet of its IP address on our local network, and uh, it just went out and found the time. So that's that's time off of uh, uh, there's a time and date API that I use. Uh, that gives me UTC. So this thing will change change with with daylight savings. Uh, there's a button here. So uh, the way this works is my kids when they uh, um, they go to high school, and on certain days they have uh, uh, they have what's called red and silver days. So red days are are different than silver days, and they kind of alternate. And so the the clock is smart enough to know the differentiate between a red day and a silver day. And there's an LED on there that the, the Pico will instruct to light up depending on what, what color day it is. Uh, and that's helpful because uh, one of my kids goes to school at a certain time on a red day. Uh, and then one of my other ki kids goes to school at a different time on a silver day. So the clock is smart enough. I, I programmed it so it's smart enough to be able to figure it out. Uh, and uh, so they both, they, they, each one of them has has the clock in their room, a uh, version of this in their room, and um, uh, and there there are like I said there there are some colored LEDs on here. There's there's uh, red, uh, I can't get them to light up, but there's red red white, which is for silver, and yellow, which is actually a bedtime indicator. So when the they'll be sitting in their room at night, in the evenings, and the yellow goes on, and that's an indicator that they're supposed to go to bed. Um, doesn't mean they pay attention to it, but that's what it means. But um, yeah, so that's that's how it works. Anyone, uh, maybe at some point we'll have a, a thing on the the Raspberry Pi Picos. The Pico is different from the uh, the actual Pis themselves. I said Raspberry Pi Pico. It's Raspberry Pico. Raspberry Pi is the single board computer, and that runs actual Linux. The 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 P, the Pies uh, come in basically two flavors or two two styles of footprints there's the the flow blown S, uh, sbc single board computer which is um i don't know five by five or something like that and that that runs linux the the newest one is the raspberry pi 5 which is actually pretty powerful and then there's a smaller which is the zero and the zero is also runs linux but it's a much smaller processor they're, they're both arm based um the pico is does not run linux it runs uh it's basically got its own uh, um, it, it, you you program it. In this case, I programmed it with with MicroPython, but you program it with Python or C, and it just boots right into the program that you 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 put in there. So there's no OS. I believe there are people who who um, put RTOS on there, which is a real time operating system. It's an open source real time operating system. Um, I haven't done that. Uh, one of these days, you know, in my copious free time, I'm going to try to do some Rust programming on there or some C programming on there, and uh, see how well that goes. So, uh, so yeah, so that's that was kind of uh, I wanted to explain that the the way you program the Picos is just a USB, uh, USB into your computer, and there's a there's a a set of tools that you can get from Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Foundation that actually talk to that uh, USB device, um, and there's also a, an IDE which is mostly what I was using, even though I, I don't use that in my regular uh, development work. Uh, there's an ID called uh, Thony, T-H-O-N-Y, and that actually does a pretty good job of uh, talking to these devices. And that I would actually, for anyone who's doing beginning work, I would I would recommend using that to to do with the Pico. And the Raspberry uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation, they have a lot of documentation online. That's the other thing about these these things. The 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 there's you can get into the into the microcontrollers and into the the regular SPCs pretty easily. They have a lot of a lot of uh, information online on their website, and of course, a lot of other people do too. The learning of the electronics came uh, was for me. I I did not grow up knowing electronics or anything, anything like that. I basically learned all this over two weeks last Christmas. And uh, what I did was I signed up. Uh, there's a uh, electronics community called Amify, which is uh, run by a guy out of Norway, I believe, or Sweden, and. Um, the really interesting. He has a bunch of courses that you can get from him, covering just the the real basics. And uh, there's even a little uh, uh, electronics kit that he'll send you, and uh, it really helps you. It, it it is, in my opinion, the best way to 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 start learning electronics as a hobbyist. So, that's all I have there. Any questions?
All right. Any other topics we want to talk about? Any cool stories we have? <laughs> well, I don't have any cool stories, but uh, well, we have a small focus group here, perhaps uh, some requests for uh, future presentations. Uh, you know, Andy and I know uh, a lot of people in a lot of areas where we might be able to bring in some expertise. Um, you know, if we know some of the topics that are interested, we could, uh, you know, ask around our uh, peer group. So I thought that might be a good idea, Andy. Yeah, what do you, what are people interested in? Matt, what are you interested in? <laughs> um, I actually I like the the news that you had focused on kind of the the different architectures for chips and like risk five and things that are kind of not quite there yet, but we're in a in a in an optimistic world things might get to with the kind of more more open um, architecture. So that's something I don't know too much about. Just following the news is good, but if someone knew more about that, I'd be interested in, to learn more. Yeah, I, I agree. The risk five, I'm, I'm, I don't really don't know what that, at, at, well, I don't know it at all, other than it is risk five. <laughs> uh, but uh, I actually have a book over here on, on computer architectures. Let me see if I can find it. But the, uh, uh, I bought it specifically because it talked about risk five. So I was trying to, I was trying to learn about this stuff, and uh, it's called uh, again, focus problems. Uh, uh, yeah, this is this is funny. This is really there. We go. Uh, anyway, it's called modern computer architecture, and you know what? I'm just gonna d undo the blur. This is getting annoying. Um, you can see my messy room. This is my family room, so that's all. It's always messy. So there we go. So uh, modern computer architectures. Uh, and an organization, and it uh, it goes through a lot of a lot of stuff. But I, I bought this book because uh, it does have uh, a section on Risk Five, an entire chapter de dedicated to Risk Five, and the the so you can learn a lot about it. Um, I I agree, Matt. I I kind of if we if we have anyone who's an expert on Risk Five, uh, then I would much appreciate any type of any type of presentation we can get on that. Uh, I've I've thought about maybe trying to organize something myself, um, but uh, that requires me to learn a good bit more. And also, uh, uh, well, I guess now I can find a RISC-V cloud server I can use. So that's kind of cool. Anybody else? Anything else you guys want to know about? Any any systems administration stuff? Well, I, I've been having a, I've been having a time. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get all my cron jobs. Never. So that they the 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 systems uses local time, but I want the cron jobs to use UTC because I am getting tired of when when daylight saving times go away, all my things get all screwed up for for the next twenty four hours. You know, jobs are going twice, and I don't know, it's just a mess. I, I so, work as a front end developer, and dealing with daytime is the bane of my existence. Yeah. So, so, so I, I got a hint from, uh, from, uh, I use uh, ZFS. And one of the, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I use a tool called, um, I, I use one of the, oops, I use one of the tools that, that, you know, to do ZFS backups and so forth. And <clears throat> uh, one of them suggested that that I I, uh, I I change all my run jobs to UTC. And so I tried doing it just by saying TC equals UTC uh, before each command, but that didn't work. And I'm you uh, and and so so I'm using a package called fcron instead of the regular cron. I don't know how I got into that years ago. It seemed to have a lot of features, but so so I've been fooling with that, trying to get the trying to get that to work, and and uh, fcron has a 
some strange functions you could put at the beginning of your, or you, know, you can put any place, but you, if if you put a function, uh, uh, I don't know if I like, uh, if I had to give a rough opinion on the, that issue, yeah, you know, the cron. I feel like uh, using cron in this way may be like a bit too much. And I feel like if you're using, if you're getting really in depth in system services, you might want to invest in like a new system that would handle it a bit better. You know, like for, for stuff on my system, I've been asking, you know, other friends what to do. And they've been telling me to switch to Docker, just wrap everything in Docker containers and just have oh, Docker God. manage the timing and, all your I've had trouble with that uh, uh, because I, I use a lot of packages and, and to use Docker, you have to mount all these things and it's a real pain in the neck, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like there's, it's, it's a pain in the neck at first, but once you have the system running and stable, then adding new services with the criteria that you want would probably be easier at that point. I see. Okay. Well, that's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, That's I, I tried by learning Nix, so I, I'm going in a different direction, but yeah. same problem. I tried to use, I tried to use free switch under Docker, and that was a real pain. I don't know if you're familiar with free switch, but I'm not. But okay, it's a it's a it's a system where you can uh, uh, generate a PPX for yourself, which I which I do a lot of conferences and. And you know other things that require PBX, so I have I have it working in the cloud, um, and hmm. uh, so it's interesting. But anyway, so the, so I'm doing a lot of weird, a lot of weird stuff like that. So I got the current stuff I think straightened out finally, uh, but it's it 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 was one of the more painful <laughs> arrangements I've done. So, anyway, so that was yeah. That well, was I wish good. you luck with your cron jobs, man. Well, yeah, I think I managed to get it going. Um, uh, there was a command I could put at the beginning of the file that changed everything to UTC. So that's what I did. Change it all to UTC. So daylight saving time won't, won't it won't do anything to it. Oh, daylight savings time. Um, <laughs> it's I mean, such a nightmare to deal with. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's I got I just got tired of every every fall you know, the job you went twice or or you know not run or all kinds of crazy stuff. Or in the spring it would not run and I don't know anyway. So I think I've permanently permanently done something. But we'll see what happens in the fall, but <laughs> But I just got tired of fooling with that. So I fooled with it a lot more to get because I got tired of fooling. I did a lot of fooling. <laughs> who who turned it on to F who turned it on to Fcron? I'm I'm I've never heard of it before. And I'm actually on their webpage as we speak and I'm trying to well figure it's, out what it's, its benefits are. Well, you, you you can do things like run the job 30 minutes after the system comes up or this sort of thing. But I'm not sure I recommended it because uh, I don't know if it's still under development anymore. Tried to contact the uh, the author and didn't have any success. But but it seemed like a you know I, I think I got it years and years and years ago for some for some reason. Um, so you you can do a lot of stuff with it, but it's tricky to use and there's a lot of different commands you put in your cron tables. That you can uh, do it, so it's. Uh, but I think I have. I think I've beaten it to death. Yeah, I. So it looks like on their website, their last stable release is in 2016. So, um, and the last development release was 2021. So I, yeah, I, I'm going to go with the the developers, not. Um, yeah. Actively working on it. Yeah, apparently not. The, the mailing list is dead. So, but I I thought it was more trouble to change over to something else since this is what I had. So but I but I, I agree it's a real 
it, it, I didn't realize it was dead when when I when I uh, did the you know like when I did this oh well so um yeah so someone in the chat said use ZREPL with system D what kind of system are you are you using I'm using I have I do have system D um uh let's see what I'm using is a sanoid and synchroid for for the for the uh for the for the CDFS. Sat which is very nice actually. It's a Perl script, so you can actually read it and see what it does. Which I really like. So look 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 up Sanoid. And that is under development. <laughs> All right. And for those I know someone asked uh in the chat uh for a link to Omify. I I, I just put it in the chat. Um uh, I do want to point out Omify is not free. It's a this is a guy who who runs a small business off of it, um, but it is pretty cool. Pretty cool little community. What is it? It's called Omify or Omify. What do you do? Oh, it's about the electronics thing. So that's that when oh, I was talking electronics. about the. Oh, yeah. I see that. Yeah. The electronics thing. Okay. Yeah. Somebody somebody asked for the for the link, and I was just saying I put it in there. All right. Any other topics we want to talk about? Does John Kennedy, who's now online and trying to uh, be uh, incognito, want to mention anything? <laughs> um I uh I, one thing I, I want to bring up is that uh since this last Nova Lug meeting, um I don't see the member in the Zoom meeting right now, but one of the other members, his username is Special K. Um he and I made a, a Discord server for uh Nova Lug and we pre-populated it with like some sane defaults. Um I don't exactly, I, you know, I'm not leadership of the group, so I don't exactly know how open you guys are to integrating it. Um, and if you are, you know, how would you want to handle that? I'm, I'm open-minded. Um, I've been helping manage it so I can adjust it and like, I can do feature, I can do pull requests on it sort of, you know, like if you have features that you want in the, in the chat rooms or whatever. So um, I'm willing to communicate with you guys about that. So, so Nikolai, we we have a committee which forms committees in order to approve things. So, uh, we'll need you to write a ten pager, and oh. submit it to the committee on committees, and we'll get it. Done. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll make a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, that was a given. You have to do the PowerPoint first. So, um, just uh, you can just uh, I, I'll I'll gladly put it up on the website and start including it in the meeting notes. Uh, if you just want to send it to the mailing list. Or send it to me, and I'll send it to the mailing list, and um, yeah, we can go from there. Um, how I I can post an invite link to the server in this Zoom chat. Would that work for you? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then we can chat through there. It's a whole What's chat. What's the class. advantage of that over email? Um, so so Discord as a product, if you've ever used Slack. It's very similar to that. So it's a chat room kind of client where you have channels, kind of like IRC. And oh, it also yeah. has a video call. We could perform these kinds of video meetings via their software as well if you don't want to use Zoom or, I, you know, that's all preference on that. But it's a chat room at, at its core. That's what it is. Yeah, just throw yeah, the invite. I have some places that are on there. Yeah, throw the invite link in and I'll I'll grab it. I I, I won't uh I won't put the or put it in the meeting notes. Um yes that's a good idea yeah yeah I, I remember someone said something about that the last meeting they were going to set up the, the discord stuff and and um uh i i guess we I, I did ask on the mailing list if anyone had it and i, I guess that was in a, a long email that um had a bunch of other stuff in there so so no i would I, I think that'd be kind of cool i'm not the not the biggest discord user um but i on occasion do use it for other things but just like a uh a chat. Uh, sure. I, I can guarantee I probably won't use it during the workday <laughs> just because I have too many other interruptions, but uh, something on my phone for the evenings or something like that. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. I, and you know, I, I, I don't even know like the excitement level within the group, you know, if, if the email is really the main way of doing communication, you know, we can, we can try it. And if we don't like it, we can sort of abandon it. There's, there's no real cost to us for, for trying it. So, 
Well, I view it as a different, just a different mode of communication. So the, the email server, the email list that we have, which we've had for a very long time, uh, that, that's a different, that's kind of a different way of long form communication, in my opinion. Um, the, the chat rooms are, are, are just another, another way of communicating. Um, and you sometimes can be more immediate. So uh, I just think it's a different mode of communicating. Um, but uh, to each his own, you know, like, I don't think everyone has a Mastodon or a Fediverse account. Um, the, the, some people may still be using some of the more uh, closed, closed uh, walled garden social media, the, uh, uh, which is fine. You know, it's, it's all preference and taste and uh, almost always, it's also got a lot to do with whoever the other people that you have to interact with or you need to interact with. Um, so fortunately uh, I just, years ago went cold turkey on Facebook and said, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, uh, out of, out of a, a deep principle of, of companies that, that tend to, uh, are really egregious with selling data, but the, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I've, you know, there are a lot of friends who I don't really keep in touch with anymore, unfortunately, but the, uh, uh, so, so, but I, I, you know, it's just a different mode. I would, I would definitely, you know, give it a try. So. Yeah, it would, um, I think it would definitely hit like different demographics, you know, for, for the group, you know, amongst people, my age range, especially gamers, that's like their main hangout spot. And I, nowadays there's more overlap between gamers and Linux users, you know, more than ever. So I think it would be a good outreach kind of portal. And I'm used to like moderating stuff like that. So I can help you guys with that. Um, yeah, I would tend to agree with that assessment, especially younger demographic. I posted in the channel here that, uh, you know, the the clan I'm in for gaming is enormous now. And the uh, Discord developers are just doing crazy good things as far as, you know, automation of even onboarding, you know, new clan mates and things like that. It has a very rich feature set. And uh, yeah, it definitely targets the younger demographic who... Um, you know, here we are talking about things like IRCs and terminals and <laughs> things like that. Um, yeah, oh, I actually, I converted to Discord from IRC. That was like, you know, vibe wise, I love IRC culture. I love chat room culture. Mm -hmm. And Discord is like the the modern one that people are using, I feel, that are in the know technologically. Yeah, it, it's it's becoming a default, like you said, gaming de facto standard. I mean, it, I think it killed Line and TeamSpeak in the, the early uh, things that people use to collaborate uh, in the gaming community. TeamSpeak is still around, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I, I know, but it, it used to be everything. And then, you know, um, people Yeah, it was a cultural spending, thing. Yeah. You know, in high school, like in, the, in the early 2000s, you know, like TeamSpeak lobbies were like, that was internet culture for me. I loved it. I thought it was so cool. But it, yeah, so Discord, that was my subject. That's that's all I have to say about it. All right. Oh, I see the link in the notes, so I appreciate that. Yeah, the accessibility leaves something to be desired, although it kind of works, but not that well. So that's the problem I have with it. With Discord? Yeah. Um, isn't it, is it web-based? At least, well, I, I know there's a... But it's not totally web-based. I mean, it's, it's sort of... It's, yeah, it's Electron, yeah. So it's sort of not quite the same thing. Yeah, do I hear a, a text reader going off back there? Yeah, um, yeah, okay. that's, yeah, that's what I use. <laughs> um, if you, if you don't like Electron, um, you know, I, especially in... Arch, ArchWiki, uh, the AUR, they have um, like Vencord, which has is like Discord with like a bunch of upgrades. They have ones with Electron fully tor torn out. So they there are third party clients that uh, you can use. Um, honestly, I I hate the distribution method, but I actually use Snap to install Discord. Um, it's it's the one that the Discord devs. Uh, put the most development on and also you know i electron is heavy but one thing i love about electron is the auto update feature um and if you in some install mediums the auto update doesn't really work it'll have you 
you really have to use aptitude to re-download it or stuff like that every couple of days. But with the snap, it auto updates, just works. All the features work. Um, maybe not activity presence because of snaps uh, uh, scoping for, for users, but you well, can again, again, accessibility with snap is very problematic. And sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can't. It it really just depends. I get oh, yeah, flat pack. Sorry, I was mixing up snap and flat pack. Uh, MFA Geary, you were in the chat. He he said it was a flat pack, and he's right. A oh, flat pack. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. Well, anyway, so uh, sorry. I, I, so I'm, I, I'm using it under Windows primarily. I've, I've not gotten it to work under Linux at all. Discord. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, I'm posting a link in the chat. There is a apparently a terminal-based uh, Discord client. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah, I just posted oh. a link. I've not used it, uh, uh, but I just found it. Um, sure. and I would for those not of it, expect video calls to work with it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, if you just want to use it for chat, obviously, obviously, if you want video uh, uh, or audio calls, it may not may not be the, the, the solution. Oh, but if you just want to chat... Good. Yeah, audio would be fine. Audio, if I could get audio, that would be good too. But I'll have to look at that. Uh, what's the name of it? It's called Discordo. I just put the the link in the chat, and I'll put it in the meeting notes really? as well. I didn't see it in there. Uh, I just put it in. Which okay. chat? The, the Zoom chat. Oh, did I? I must have directed that message. Hold on. For whatever no. reason... You aren't going it, to the group. It didn't get it. it did, I didn't get that the message. Maybe you sent it to so. There we go. Yeah. Party <laughs> fail. <laughs> yes. I'm not the... Uh, oh, obviously, Zoom has some issues as well. So yeah, and for those I, of us I, using yeah. Nix, both Discord and Zoom are in, are in the Nix, are a Nix package. So mm -hmm. as well. Uh I'll have to see if I'll have to see if it's in my Gen two distribution. Steve and to everyone calling speaking of topic. Still not running Wayland on my PC. I want to. But I'm not giving up proprietary graphics. That's I still want a game. <laughs> oh. So yeah. I will I will tell you this. When I switched over to, to Nix, I did switch to Wayland as well. And I noticed, so I'm not using, I don't, I'm not a gamer and I don't do, um, uh, I, I, whatever this laptop is that I'm using, I, I believe it's got a, an AMD, uh, graphics, uh, processor. The, uh, um, I noticed a big speed improvement over, over x86. So that was like, uh, it was one of those, it was one of the most noticeable, noticeable things. I was just like, oh, wow, this is much snappier. And I didn't think my system was, un, was like, Unperformant before or anything like that. I, I you know, to me it it seemed to seem to be fine, but I noticed uh, I noticed it was just much faster under Wayland, like the graphics. So, um, oh yeah, and I, I there's a lot less issues and stuff. You know, like screen tearing and you know, like if you're watching like a video, like a YouTube video, it's just way more stable. You know, I I just get like artifacts and stuff with with XOR, you know, based. Uh, you know, rendering of that stuff. And plus, I like Hyperland, which I think is very aesthetic desktop environment. You know, I've, I want to swap entirely over to that. Can someone explain what Hyperland is? I, I, that's, I know it's something to do with Wayland, but I don't know exactly know what it is. Well, like, if Wayland is like X11, Hyperland is like I3. So it's like a win, it's a window manager. Um, and it's a tiling based window manager. So it's based off of hotkeys instead of dragging your windows around like in plasma or windows. So it, Hyperland is probably the best tiling window manager for Wayland. It was Sway, but Hyperland actually recently beat it, uh, got more stars on it. It's now the most starred um, uh, window manager for Wayland. So very popular and, you know, tiling window managers, they were niche, you know, they were, I got into them from like 
you know, like the Unix porn people from Reddit and, and you know, that, that aesthetic that's being applied to Wayland and Hyperland is what does that, you know? So I, I like it a lot as far as like um, a pretty and configurable desktop environment. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just Wayland based and getting it with proprietary graphics. I'm, that's my personal hurdle. Yeah, I've used I've used tiling window managers in the past. Um, just never never sticks with me. <laughs> I think they're so cool. You know, I like tiling window managers with like a lot of padding on the windows, and you know, having like your Neo Fetch you know, RIP. Yeah, you know, that's <laughs> it's a whole vibe. I I really like it a lot. Um, and yeah, you know, Hyperland is really uh, pushing the boundaries of it. And Hyperland is sort of unique in that they're like the, probably the most popular a tiling window manager is like ever getting. <laughs> you know, i3 is really popular, but Hyperland has a lot of uh, hype behind it and the development is moving incredibly fast. So I'm very excited to sort of integrate it and see where it goes. Yes, well, <laughs> I do love my Emacs too. Getting, uh, I I'm trying to get like a an Emacs setup, you know, like Emacs everywhere where you always have like a window. I'm trying to learn um, like note taking, you know, through like org Rome and all that stuff. So I'm, uh, you know, trying to integrate that into my desktop environment too. Too many. Oh, I love, I love Emacs. <laughs> I love Emacs. So, what is this in the chat? My brother-in-law spent a year developing with Nano on Linux. Oh wow, Nano! Should have waited for this new update. <laughs> yeah, there's a new update. The great keyboard shortcut to quit the program. That's a new uh, feature. Uh, we we should be based. yeah. We should be we should shouldn't be hard on people who use Nano, but uh, um, I mean, I use it every once in a while, uh, especially when I'm on a system that doesn't have anything else installed. Uh, but but still, uh, and if people use it. People actually, I guess some people like it, but yeah, I, I consider it kind of limiting myself. So the the actual, the text editor I, I use and uh, the most is Helix, uh, which is uh, Rust-based. Yeah, it's, it's written in Rust. And the reason I switched over to it um, is because the, so I was doing, um, I was doing a lot of Java programming and then Kotlin programming. And you use, uh, you know, people who do Java and especially Kotlin tend to use the JetBrains IDEs a lot. And uh, I, I even had to own my own personal license for that, for their, uh, for their, their professional version of that. And then I started doing Rust programming and, and uh, they, uh, JetBrains has a Rust uh, plugin, which you can use with their, uh, their, their IDEs. And I found that it was not uh, it was not keeping up. Like it was it was actually because of the way uh, Rust is very much like you need a, a good compiler and you need a good a good uh, uh, um, uh, language server. And the the Rust stuff uh, it, it was the, the ID was just getting slow. And so I switched over to to versions of NeoVim. Uh, I think AstroVim was the one I I tried the most. And even it was having a hard time. And so the thing that I've found that works the best when you have um, a system that is constantly hitting your CPU, and uh, especially for a large Rust project, uh, Helix was the best one. And it seems kind of natural because the guy who, who writes, the, the people who started Helix are Rust developers themselves. And I think one of the reasons they started it was because they wanted a fast IDE. But uh, it's terminal-based, so it's, it's a modal terminal uh, uh, editor. Uh, it does more than Rust, so you can. Uh, it's got a. They use the the the. Um, um, I forget what it's called. The the tree uh, tree sitter uh, 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 packages in order to do the different grammars and so forth, and you can you can install stuff. And so that uh, that's what I've been using. And uh, so if you're used to Vim, it's kind of Vim ish, I guess, or Vi ish in that it, you can you you. Have the 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 JKL uh, I keyboard navigation stuff, but um, the the unlike Vim or unlike VI, 
uh, it has a different selection mode. So you actually select the thing you're doing. Uh, you select the thing you want to operate on, and then you do. Then you hit your key for whatever operation, like yank or whatever. Uh, whereas VI is the opposite, right? You have to say, "I want to yank," and then I want to yank three lines. Well, in 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 uh, Helix, it's the other way around. You basically say, "I want to. I want these three lines, and then I want to yank them." So, um, so it's a little bit better, in my opinion, it's a little bit better in trying to understand what you're doing. Um, uh, and Helix, the difference between Helix and Vim or NeoVim is that uh, Helix is kind of like batteries included uh, editor. You're not running around trying to get five different uh, uh, extensions to work and stuff like, like that. You don't, you don't spend your lifetime becoming a, a NeoVim uh, configuration manager or whatever. The uh, uh, Like Helix, you just compile it and set it up. You know, you may have one config file and you, off you go. So... Event from everyone calling looks very interesting. Dot dot dot. Bit. Using IntelliJ Plus plugin and more recently their Rust Rover variant. Dot dot. How did you find Helix? Question. I haven't heard of it. From Jimbert to everyone calling, I often use Vim apostrophe s nip for side dash by dash side set of two files. Period. Well. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just reading the chat. So yeah, the rest the Rust Rover stuff, which that's the that my is my understanding is that I haven't used it. Um, because I, I started doing, I switched over to Helix before Rust Rover came out, but Rust Rover is uh, IntelliJ's um, Rust specific IDE. Whereas before, if you had IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate, I guess you could get the Rust plugin. Or if you had C Line, you could get the Rust plugin, and th and that would work. And that's not half bad. Uh, the the other thing I always do, always did with the IntelliJ products is I always got their their VI plugin because uh, I wanted the the VI key bindings. And so, and and truthfully, that's probably one of the things that stops me from using Nano in any type of serious way is because it's the regular like GUI style key bindings in Nano. And so, so the, the moment I start doing anything serious, I'm like, uh, I need to go get something else. So, which is generally Helix. So, and I've never used Vim's diff side by side diff. I didn't. I actually didn't even know if it had had that. But that sounds pretty cool. Using B slash since one nine eight four comma, avoiding switching editors every few years. Period. Oh, Vimdiff is very nice uh, when, yeah, does some nice things. Yeah, I see that using VI since nineteen eighty four. So way back in the day, I guess it wasn't that long ago, maybe twenty years ago, I was using a, a VI clone called Elvis, and I would install that on everything, and uh, I thought that was like the best editor ever. But the guy who who was maintaining that uh, eventually decided that uh, Vim had won out, and so he wasn't he wasn't uh, he wasn't interested in continuing continuing with it. But uh, Elvis, I thought, was like a really cool, uh, really cool editor. So it, it had multiple modes, kind of like uh, GVim and Vim. So there was a graphical version of it. So I thought it was pretty cool. Factory to everyone colon I was forced to use Vim in college comma. Well not forced. I did an apostrophe T feel like finding an I and just coded washed into the school server period. So I just stuck with that comma and eventually learned I'd have variable completion and highlighting. I John, I don't know how you can how you listen to that at such a high speed. Oh, oh I'm sorry to disturb <laughs> you. I didn't need to oh. No, no. It was actually I'm actually like, oh okay, so now I know now I know what it is. I know there's people chatting and I'm just like, oh okay, so there's something yeah. going on in the chat. But then I, I tried to like parse it in my head. I'm like, what? Okay, that was listen, that was a little too fast for me. Yeah, Dude, well, listen, listen faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the, yeah. I I listen as fast as I can. I I I couldn't do it any slower. It would drive me nuts. Yeah, I mentioned in the the chat a little while ago that I had a uh, a coworker who was visually impaired who had a screen reader called Jaws. And... Yeah, that's what I. That's what I, that's oh. what you're hearing. Yeah, I thought it's. I thought it sounded like that. Um, and he would even if a little bit quicker than you have it. Um, but you know, in the network uh, uh, realm, he would be reading stuff off of you know uh, consoles and things like that from his laptop to a you know a network device, and it would come across as just you know, oh my god, how is he you know dealing with this, or showing multicast routes or stuff like that? So 
Uh, it's very impressive, but yeah, most people I know that have had screen readers like that always speed them up a little bit so that it's, you know, they're taking it in in a, a quicker fashion than we would. Yeah, I, I well, well, I have a screen reader for Linux too. I have I have something called Speak Up, which is a console, a kernel based one, and then uh, for Emacs, if I can get it to work, I have something called Emacs Speak, which is a thing. But then you know. So there's lots of, but so I'm always interested in what's accessible, what's not, you know, that I have to pay really a lot of attention to that. Yeah, I took a, because of this cover, I took a big interest in uh, accessibility and who says they have it. And then, you know, we would work with him and say, well, this, this isn't an accessible product, whatever they're telling you, they're lying to you. Right. Yeah. Well, the other thing I do, if I'm, I record if if I hear a lecture or something, I speed that up too, uh, uh, because then you know that's a lot easier for me to listen to it at a higher speed. <laughs> so, see, um, my main video content is Twitch and YouTube, and especially for YouTube, I I do change the speed slider for how fast the video plays. If someone is talking to me like you guys are at that kind of speed. I actually speed it up to like 1.25 or even 1.5 um, just to like get through it faster. Yeah, I, sure. It, it definitely is like, I have low, way lower attention span though. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, people. Uh, you have to have an attention span to do this stuff anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true. But so on Linux, the only uh, GUI screen reader is Orca. So I have to, so there's a lot, you know, it's not quite as mature as the Windows ones, but From to everyone so I have to be very careful of what apps I put on there and make sure they all work. And it's, uh, everyone, quote, a friend of mine. it's quite a deal. Factory to everyone, colon, one, HR video becomes three, zero minutes. Okay, so, uh, right. oh, oh th thank you for that conversation, John. That was very good. Oh, sure. Oh, I I, I, like I said, I have a lot of interest in it. Um, and somebody said maybe it's a future talk, uh, maybe around the Linux accessibility and um, uh, so forth. So uh, I'm, okay, I've, been, well. I, I've been jotting down uh, some of the suggestions for uh, topics that we might investigate. Again, Andy and I have a lot of resources to find people. Uh, we also welcome any of you who want to um, give a presentation and or if uh, you know of somebody that uh, you can put us in contact with that might be a, a good speaker, we could try to reel them in also. Uh, what I've taken down today as far as uh, topics that Andy and I could look into and see what we have in our uh, you know, Rolodex, it's a bit anachronistic, uh, Linux security, uh, dealing with Linux drivers uh, at a low level, uh, processors and processor development, uh, basic list Linux systems administration, and then now this one as well as uh, you know accessibility options in uh, Linux and free and open source. So um, I'll I'll ship these over to Andy here uh, after the meeting. Uh, okay, I, great. Yeah, I think since we are, it feels like we're winding down a little bit. We aren't in person yeah. to. Uh, you know, sit here and, and share the coffee. Uh, again, it looks like we'll be back on site next month. Uh, we encourage all of you, always bring a friend um, and try to reel in some of the younger people too, because uh, I've noticed, and I said this in chat just for fun, that with my kids, none of my kids are following in my footsteps. Um, I think yeah, a, lot of, really. a, lot of, a lot of us would like to pass on some of our knowledge, but uh, kids just wanted all the work today. And, you know, they're very good at using computers, but they aren't very good at uh, what goes on under the hood, uh, and especially in the networking realm, they just you know there are so many so few so many fewer uh, employees. The ones I tend to get her um, from developing worlds, <laughs> who have to still deal with uh, you know hands on to the uh, networking infrastructure and stuff like that. Uh, they come in a lot more hungry and a lot more um, learned because you know the infrastructure in the uh, United States is very mature. Uh, compared to some of the other developing parts of the world. So uh, that's just my perspective there. Andy, do you have anything you'd like to close us out with? Um, I'm, I'm, I am curious how many people would, so, so 
when we when we started Novalog back up again, we were trying to we we did want to put an emphasis on the in person meetings, uh, simply because a lot of people uh, the 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 when we when you know we had the large discussion on the mailing list. And there was a lot of interest in in you know wanting to go back in in person. People have been uh, basically over COVID, you know, doing a lot of video conferences, and so there was a there's a lot of a lot of meetings, uh, a lot of, just a lot of interest in doing it. And I've noticed after the you know we've only done two in person meetings so far, but even after those two in person meetings, we had uh, there there's just a lot of people who stand around and talk. And uh, which is exactly, I mean, that's that that's a that's a great thing. Uh, the the uh, you know we may have topics and 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 you know presenters, and that's what brings us together for the meeting. That's kind of like the forcing function. But the in the end, this is about this is about uh, networking. It's about uh, uh, and about having fun. And uh, you know, a lot of us share this passion on uh for linux and open source and and uh personally that's what i want to see out of it is just trying to bring the trying to bring the 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 fun back into tech uh my personally i feel that tech has we, we've kind of lost it over the years um uh things has gotten so corporate and so out of hand so uh so that that's that's what really what i want for this this group but i'm curious that uh as, you know as we we've been focusing on the in person stuff how many people would if we if we worked out some sort of hybrid arrangement, which we have been working on, it just hasn't worked very well. Um, if we if we were able to to do a hybrid thing, like where we set up a a, a Zoom camera and uh, uh, and had Zoom going on the in person meetings, um, how many people would would attend virtually? Uh, I'm just kind of curious if you know, like raise your hand or or say something in the chat. I'd, it'd be interesting to know. Yeah, I I, I would because I can't really get over there. So I'd love to do to uh, do it virtually. So okay, and how many how many people would uh um would would if you uh like would would you use it like you could attend virtually uh, or you could attend in person, but for whatever reason uh like you would you would do that do the virtual stuff um uh, uh just because like you had to do that in a pinch or something like that. I'm just kind of curious. So, and then how many people, okay, so I would attend virtually uh, on occasionally. Okay. Yeah. So I, I see that a lot. There are some people who, who just like, like life happens. And so attending virtually is something else. So, and how many people, so I've noticed the, uh, it's like the, the, you know, Peter Larson was on here earlier, the, the international Linux group, they meet virtually, uh, I think all the time. Uh, and how many people would, would want to just have virtual meetings? Like, um, Okay. Like exclusively? Yeah, exclusively. No, I'm I'm against that. Hmm. I you know, I, I talk a lot online through Zooms in my day job. So I really value in person stuff in my free time. I try mm -hmm. to socialize in my free time. So, you know, I, I do in uh, aspect of it. Yeah, I, I agree with Nikolai there. I mean, I, I think if we came up with a regular hybrid meeting that did allow remote interaction. Uh, it would be the best of both worlds. I mentioned in chat though, that uh, there's some acquisition of uh, technology, software and things like that we would have to acquire for a, a smooth running meeting, as well as some changes in etiquette when you're either all local or you know all Zoom. And many of you have dealt with this in uh, the last few years of COVID and the, uh, you know, um, advancement of zoom meetings you know zoom is the new xerox right you know no matter what platform you're using you kind of say let's zoom today um so uh, andy and i will definitely be looking at this um personally again like nikolai uh you know i kind of need that human interaction and you know shake the hand on the other side of the monitor sometimes because i've been remote for 13, 12 years i think yeah and so i i have two other questions so the uh, the meetings uh, are tend to be uh, we tend to do them Saturday mornings ten to noon. Um, does that turn? So the re only reason uh, when we started back up, we 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 just assumed like the same time frame as the the previous the previous meetings. But uh, and I'm I'm a little hesitant to put things like on weekend or week weeknights. Um, I just think that you know, people are just very busy. I know I am. For me to to tear me away at, at the end of a workday to go do something. 
uh, can be kind of can can be kind of difficult. Plus, I I tend to even sometimes have meetings during that time. The uh, but does the time frame work for everybody? Is or or uh, I I, I kind of think that's kind of the sweet spot. But I have run into a couple of people who who especially people with younger children, uh, Saturday mornings just don't work for them. Uh, so I'm curious if uh, if there's any feedback on that. Like the left coast meetings have no no respect for time zones. Yeah, uh, yeah I like good morning myself. Uh, you know, if I can, you know, particularly if I can uh, get in virtually, that's great for me. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm seeing Saturday mornings best. Uh, maybe maybe switching it from eleven to one. I don't know. Um, what about so? The, my second question is. If we organize like a uh, like a, a morning coffee at like nine a.m. before the meetings, or uh, or maybe a lunch after that, would people be interested in that? I'd be down for the lunch after, but I, the the nine a.m. Uh, you know, I already work. You know, it's it, it's too much like a work day at that point for me, where <laughs> time wise, I'd like to sleep in just a little. Uh, all right, so I'm getting a lot of positive feedback on the on the lunch after, so lunch, we can. Yeah. Yeah, we can we can um, we can see about that. Uh, so undergrad Chris, we often did lunch after meetings. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I only attended on occasion when Greg was around. Um, uh, but the uh, uh, but yeah, I think the uh, yeah, I'm not paying. But uh, as long as uh, I, I think it's it's pretty good. So we can if we're at Ridgeline, I think it's probably easy for us to like run over to the mall or something like that um, or find something yeah grep grep uh grep prisby so the uh so i think it would be easy for us to run over the mall or or find something uh that could accommodate us so that's really all i have uh so i think we're gonna we're gonna end it here appreciate everyone showing up and um hopefully this gets saved to my hard drive and i can upload it to youtube uh later on all right thanks everyone see you everybody around have a great day good weekend I, I have ma I have maintenance now. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Talk to y'all later.